we're going to talk about balance. So we started to talk about some of the principles in balance already throughout the semester, and you'll start to see, again, how a lot of the stuff that we've covered throughout the semester um, relates and builds on each other and is in use um, in balance, right? So basically, balance is a distribution of visual weight within a composition, right? Whether it's symmetrical, asymmetrical, um, radial, etc. We'll get into the specifics in a little bit. Um, but essentially, um, balance is based off of an axis, some kind of axis, which is a line of reference um, for uh, around the composition is balanced, right? If that makes sense. Um, a lot of times for a symmetrical piece, it's right down the middle, vertical, um, a vertical line down the center of the piece. In this case, the axis is not down the center of the piece. It's a little bit off to the right-ish. So we basically have this axis right here. Um, and then you have equilibrium, which is visual balance between opposing compositional elements. So for example, in this case, the very dark line of figures that we have walking in the rain versus this essentially negative space, right? So we have a visual balance, right, between the heavy dark figures and the rain and this light sort of more washed out background, right? So even though this is asymmetrical, we still have a sort of even distribution of visual weight, right? And so these are the kind of things that we're going to start to talk about um, today. Um, generally, when equilibrium is lacking, which can be done with a purpose, um, it sort of creates that, I always sort of, I hate to say uneasiness, but that kind of like tension or uneasiness, that imbalance, it kind of throws you off a little bit. Um, as in this example here, and we'll get into more detail. Um, again, equal distribution of visual weight. Uh, most compositions, if not all, are either balanced consciously or unconsciously, right? As, as creators, as artists, um, or even just as humans, we have a tendency to like want to balance things visually. Um, so whether we're doing it consciously or unconsciously, um, most, if not all, compositions have some sort of balance within them, right? Um, in this case, we have an example of imbalance, so this unequal distribution of visual weight. Um, so you can use imbalance in your compositions to create that tension um, to enhance a theme or topic. Um, so you have, if you have a, a composition with more weight on the bottom, it presents as a little bit more stable, a little bit more calm. Um, when you have more weight on top, it presents as relatively unstable, so like in this composition where we have this is more top weighted and then you have where the bottom there's less elements it sort of gives this sense of tension unease like these things are going to topple over kind of like when we talked about in compositions uh, I think it was last presentation or presentation or so ago when we talked about creating that tension creating a dynamic layout a sense of movement kind of thing you can use balance to do that as well there's generally four types of balance Symmetrical, asymmetrical, radial, and crystallographic, which is an all-over pattern. We'll get into specifics of all of these. Symmetrical balance or bilateral symmetry. Uh, generally, they're the easiest to recognize and see. It's basically, things are the same on the right and left sides. Um, in this case, in our example, um, we have our photograph of Audrey Hepburn. We have an unedited and an edited version. So an unedited, generally, the human face is symmetrical. Generally, technically it's not. Um, technically it's asymmetrical. The human form is usually asymmetrical. So you can see even here, one ear lobe is a little bit lower than the other. The eyes are slightly different. The sides of the nose are technically different, that whole thing, whatever. But in general, the human face, body, etc., is a, a symmetrical or an example of symmetrical balance. And then we have our edited version here where they've literally copied and flipped one side of her face and had made, have made it completely symmetrical, which is honestly a little bit off-putting um, when you are looking at the human face, right? A human face should not be like perfectly symmetrical. It's a little bit weird. It looks like, it definitely looks, I don't know, at least to me, I find it off-putting. It looks a little bit like, it looks edited and it looks not real, right? Um, symmetry has a tendency to unify, right? Um, another term is formal balance. Uh, this type of symmetry is also called classical balance. Um, generally, classical balance or formal balance creates that feeling of strength, stability, permanence, um, 
it gives sort of like a sense of calm, steadiness, et cetera. It's usually used in architecture um, more often than not government buildings and churches. It's like when you have government or religion, you want that sort of sense of stability, strength, et cetera. So in this case, we have our church pulpit here. Everything, if you drew a imaginary line down the center of this, aside from the text, it's pretty well symmetrically balanced. Lots of horse, uh, lots of strong horizontal lines, uh, strong vertical lines to give it that sort of sense of stability. Um, but again, sort of when you have buildings, when you have architecture, architecture that are sort of symbols of power usually um, or control, you have that sort of symmetrical balance, right? That formal classical uh, symmetrical balance. And then in art here. Uh, many things in nature are symmetrical, but we talked about the human face, um, some leaves, the way some vegetables grow, etc. Um, there is, uh, I always forget if it's broccoli or cauliflower, but there's a specific type of cauliflower or broccoli that grows in a fractal pattern, which is kind of really interesting. I'll pull it up later. Um, it's really weird. It looks like, it 100% looks fake, but it's like this weird fractal, I think it's broccoli, but it grows in like this really interesting, almost golden ratio ratio, fractal kind of pattern. So we see it in nature all the time, right? Or in art when it's created. But usually when successfully employed, uh, you can reinforce the subject or even become the emphasis of your piece. Like in this case, we have our symmetrical balance here where we've, or well they, have again sort of like Audrey, they've copied and flipped our elements here. Um, and then we start to get into some elements that we'll talk about a little bit later. But we have a more unified balance in general with the large plane of texture that we have in the mountains here balanced by a more out of focus, I mean there's a few gradient spots but a relatively less textured, more flat color and then it's also blocked by these two darker corners with less, less texture in them and then the text almost disappears um, to where the the objects in the background almost become more of the subject, right? But this is a good example of symmetrical balance using texture and also value for the composition overall. Uh, then we can talk about asymmetrical balance. So basically asymmetrical balance or informal balance is where you have objects that are dissimilar having equal visual weight um, with each other basically. So here we've talked about it a little bit with how objects will relate to each other. So if you had uh, like a black circle, a black square, and a red circle, I always have to think when I say that. The black circle will relate to the red circle because it's also a circle, but it will relate to the square because they're both black. Um, so in this case, we have essentially three technically, but four groups of objects that are very, very dissimilar, right? But this whole composition, as a sculptural composition, is very well balanced, right, visually. So we have our two smaller, darker objects that carry more visual weight compared with this giant block that carries the most visual weight. But if you look at the two together, the two darker black objects in general, there's like a sense of balance throughout the whole thing. And the same thing can be said with the red. It has less visual weight, but there's more of them at the top here. So it's essentially balanced out by the three boxes and this large rectangle-ish of red here. So overall, we've created a balanced composition, even though you have shapes that are relatively dissimilar, you have colors that are relatively dissimilar, but they'll relate to each other in a variety of different ways visually. Asymmetrical balance um, in photography in this composition. Um, generally, it's a lot harder to plan an a, a, a well-balanced asymmetrical um, composition. It takes a lot more, I shouldn't say more thought than balance, but balance, uh, uh, rather symmetrical. Uh, a symmetrical composition is a little bit easier because essentially you just copy what's on one side and flip it to the other side. Where creating a, a balanced asymmetrical piece is a lot harder. It takes a lot more planning. Um, to make it seem less rigid, to make it seem casual. So like this photo seems like a relatively casual snapshot, right? But it's very, very, very well planned. Again, with this large plane of essentially gray for our background, balanced really well by this heavy 
darkness of their shirt and their hair. <clears throat> They're also off center to the right just a little bit to give a little bit more of this gray in the background. And then you have this object, which I believe is a lamp, but you have this object in the bottom corner to sort of break up that large plane, um, that large gray plane, and to give a little bit, not directly, but give a little bit of relational, uh, or a little bit of a relationship between the dark here in her shirt and the dark here. So again, something like this that seems relatively like a casual studio snapshot um, takes a lot of planning to make it look that way, right? It takes a lot of work to make something look casual. Um, there's a variety of different ways to create asymmetrical balance. This is where we're going to start touching on some of the topics that we've already talked about. Um, by value or color, by texture or pattern, position or eye direction. Again, I say it like almost every single time, but leading the viewer's eye through a piece uh, so like in this case, um, by value or color, a darker, smaller element uh, is roughly visually equal to a larger, lighter one. So in this case, we have a dark, black, smaller square compared to a larger square that's lighter in color and has a little bit of texture, but lighter in color. So the dark, the smaller dark object will carry, give or take, just about the same visual weight as a larger, lighter object. Um, by value or color. Um, again, when we look back to our uh, color theory section, right, when we talked about um, having a balance through value, right, uh, if we can think of those three examples, we had the two different patterns, and then we had the one that was all vivid colors. So since the value of all of the vivid colors, including black, was even, it was a relatively balanced piece. So a similar, <clears throat> similar in this case, all of the values are relatively Similar, <clears throat> even though we have a very dark black with a very bright yellow, those values are pretty much pushed to the max. So you have a general overall balance with the color values. But then between the balance, the smaller, darker objects, like the smaller black objects of their body, are going to carry more visual weight. Um, so they need essentially a larger, lighter color background with a yellow. So these darker shapes, even though this tan is not really that dark, but the tan and the black and even the white help through the line work, help to balance this piece, even though it's asymmetric, right? Uh, balance by texture and pattern. Um, so texture, we've talked about texture, right? So a variegated dark and light pattern, um, how texture can add interest. It will add visual interest to any object. Um, texture will draw the eye more than smooth or flat color. So if we go back, if we had some of these smaller pieces, even the pants, let's say, if that was textured rather than a flat color, that would have more visual impact um, than the yellow, <clears throat> the yellow areas here. So um, this small complicated shape here has just about the same visual interest as this larger more simple, stable shape, right? Even though they have the same texture, right? So a more complicated shape is going to have a little bit more um, visual weight. Um, balance by texture and pattern still. Uh, a smaller textured pattern can balance a larger untextured shape, right? So even though this object is much smaller, it carries, again, a similar visual weight when compared to a heavier, more flat-ish, in this case, shape. And then all these principles in use here in this Japanese woodcut. Um, <clears throat> so this large mountain, relatively simple. There's a little bit of texture in here, but not as much as the rest of the woodcut. But this larger, relatively less textured object is balanced by the texture in the forest, and then also the texture in the clouds and the sky. So you have a good amount of visual balance between, again here, value and texture and the shape of the object. So even though the forest is significantly smaller than this mountain, it's got a lot more texture, so it'll carry more visual weight or carry more visual interest. Um, by position or direction, so when we talk about like static versus dynamic layouts, again, something that we've mentioned um, in a variety of presentations, 
Um, but you can think of physics principles, right? So if we have these objects, if they were in our layout, if we have this larger object further or in give or take about the same spot on this seesaw, we'll say, uh, lever, whatever you want to call it. Um, if we had it further out, obviously it's going to be weighted to that larger object. In order to essentially create a more <clears throat> physical balance, we would need to move that larger object more towards the center of the balance point to actually get it balanced. So you can think about visual balance in a similar way, right? So, so physics can somewhat, obviously not literally, but physics can sort of conceptually um, inform balance as well, right? Um, connecting the eyes, again, so we've talked about this before. Um, this composition may seem weighted to the left with the two figures here and also larger than the one figure to the right. Um, it may seem um, imbalanced, right? But how they connect this piece and make it a little bit balanced goes back to, uh, I think it was our first presentation, um, the line work presentation. So we have this like implied line with the gaze between these two figures and even potentially an implied line between the gaze with these two figures or even him looking over here. And then we have actual lines of the arches here sort of connecting the viewer's eye from the left to the right or right to left depending on how you're reading it. Um, so you're connecting the eyes through the piece to create a visual balance through leading the viewer's eye through the piece, right? Through line work in this case, right? Generally to achieve asymmetrical overall balance, um, there's usually more than one method in play at the same time. Um, you rarely just have one of these elements. Um, again, even though we're talking about line work here, we have implied lines versus physical, for lack of a better word, physical lines, right? So even there we have two different types of line work helping to create balance here. Here we have a lot going on. We have differences in texture between the top and the bottom of this piece. You have this large area of darker blue with the texture of the clouds compared to the sand at the bottom that has not that it doesn't have any texture, but it has a lot less texture. It's a little bit more washed out. You have this object, this car, that's white, doesn't necessarily have as many details as this sort of more dynamic curved canopy that has the horizontal lines giving it more detail, more texture. So you have these two elements balanced. You have, again, the asymmetrical balance between the figures here. You almost have a symmetrical balance between these two figures, and then you have these technically two figures. I honestly just noticed that there's a baby right there for the first time this presentation. I've showed this slide a whole bunch of times and I never noticed there was a baby. Um, but anyway, you see there's a lot of various things in play here. We have texture, line, um, value, detail, etc. to create a well-balanced asymmetrical piece in this case. So radial balance one of the most common places that we see radial balance is in nature, in snowflakes, for example, um, or if you look at um, dandelions when they're little puffballs. If you actually look at the puffball, it's like this perfect, like, radial, I don't know, radial sphere that has similar, this is a snowflake, but similar to this, where it has one central point, basically. So radial balance has one central point that everything else radiates out from, right, and is roughly, I mean, it's technically asymmetrical, but it's roughly symmetrical, right, because it's nature, there's going to be, you know, again, with our face, it's going to be, there's going to be some, some dissimilarities, but in general, relatively balanced, right. Um, there's a lot of um, aspects of nature in um, crafts like jewelry and ceramics that are reflected a lot um, in those types of uh, applications. Radio balance is really common in cultural symbols. Uh, in this case, um, in Tibetan mandalas um, or in um, <clears throat> rose windows of Gothic churches or other churches in general. Um, so you'll see here, these are some mosaics that are put together in this triad. So you have on the left and the right, you have your sort of central radius here, and then all of the design elements in a balanced way radiate off of those two 
here and the right one, they balance off of this radial point to create this radially, I don't think that's a word, balanced piece, right? Um, it also comes up in architecture and city planning a lot, um, specifically with city planning. Um, so this is an old map of Italy. So we have our central plaza, right? Most cities, even downtown Bangor, we have our sort of central location. You have your downtown, you have your city center, and then everything kind of radiates or should radiate or build off of that, right? So we generally have a symmetrical general radial balance, not quite radial in literally radial in city planning, but you can see how everything sort of radiates off of one central point, right? Uh, and then we have crystallographic balance, right? So essentially an all over pattern that is generally repeated. It doesn't mean that the elements are exactly repeated throughout um, or the pattern is repeated exactly throughout, but you'll see similar elements, right? So you have these, in this case, you have these sort of sweeping circular objects or elements. And even though they're not exactly the same, they might be slightly different colors, there's a general sense of sameness throughout this entire piece, right? So it's basically symmetrical balance that constantly repeats throughout an entire um, composition. Um, a good use of this is Chuck Close. Um, Chuck Close is an American artist, um, relatively recently passed away. Um, this is some of his earlier work where he would essentially, it was, wasn't quite pointillism. Um, he also did some photography and more uh, photorealistic fine art photography. He's more well known for this type of uh, art where he creates these grids and essentially this crystallographic balance throughout his uh, entire pieces. Um, but he had um, uh, an, a spine, I, I always forget the medical term and I just looked it up, um, a spinal inclusion, which was like essentially, I'm going to mess it up and my wife who's the nurse is going to correct me. Um, basically he had a, a blockage in a, uh, I'm pointing to my back like you guys can see it. Um, he had a, um, a spinal hemorrhage, essentially, which paralyzed him. So he had to modify how he created art, right? So he had this sort of style already where he was kind of gritting out these portraits and doing this sort of crystallographic pattern, right? And then this was a little bit looser, or the, the pattern, rather, it's a little bit looser as he started to have problems with his body and as his body started to sort of degenerate. Um, and then he had to come up with, and this is a sort of more recent one, and this is a little bit more recent, but you can see that it's almost like pointillism. As you back further away, there's a little bit more detail. Um, but again, as his health sort of deteriorated, he had to come up with various ways to sort of continue the style. And the style got a little bit looser to the point where he was in a wheelchair and he like literally would basically tie or fix brushes to his hands and then work work from there. And then this other, <clears throat> this right side of the slide is basically just to give you an idea of the sense of scale of his pieces. Um, this is fairly standard-ish, maybe even bigger for a lot of Close's work. Um, as you can see, the gentleman here looking at the piece. These are, I would say, relatively small for a lot of his work. Um, but I wanted to show you sort of a more contemporary use of sort of this crystallographic pattern um, used in contemporary art. 